you, David. We're going to turn together, please, to the book of Romans in the New Testament, and we're going to read a few verses, first of all, from chapter 7, and then we're going to read a number of verses from chapter 8. And it's a lengthy reading, but bear with me as we read this uh, scripture uh, together. So Romans chapter 7 and verse 21. Romans chapter 7 verse 21. Paul is writing to the church at Rome and this is what he says. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord so then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, and it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh, for if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of adoption again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Come over with me now, please, for sake of time, to verse 25. But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Likewise. The Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the heart, that is God, knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Amen. And we know God will bless this lengthy reading of his word. Let's bow in prayer together. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for uh, this time together. We thank you for the opportunity and the desire that is in our heart, Lord, to know your word. There were many days in our lives when we had no interest or desire to hear your word. But we thank you, Lord, that you have changed us and you have planted desires in us that are from another world. We thank you for that. I pray now, Lord, that you would just surround us again with your conscious presence. Lord, would you send the Holy Spirit to come and speak to us and to make Jesus real. I pray, Lord, that you would take me as I give myself completely to you. 
Please cleanse me, Lord, by your blood. Please sanctify and set me apart and fill me with the Holy Spirit. And I pray that your name would be glorified through your word and by the consciousness of your presence. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I was praying during the week and saying, Lord, what, what am I going to preach on on Friday night, as I often do, and ask the Lord about it? And this particular portion of Scripture seemed to keep rolling through my mind. And during the last few weeks, I've had a number of people calling at the home as they come for various issues in their life. But there was like a repetitive uh, in uh, the messages that I was receiving from people and uh, they were basically often saying the same thing. And what they were really, despite the external problems they were obviously wanting addressed, there was an internal problem that they all uh, readily accepted was a problem. And that was a real deep sense of failure as a Christian. A real deep sense of failure. And to, come, to accompany that failure came a deep sense of condemnation over them as Christians. That is, they seem to be constantly tortured with the fact that they are failures. This, in turn, is accompanied with a deep sense of spiritual dryness. And uh, they are conscious that while they can listen to perhaps preachers or go to conventions or be in certain settings or meet other Christians that seem to have a buoyancy and a, a joy and a type of life that seems to elude them, and so this dryness is there, and because it has been there perhaps for many years, they have essentially resigned to the fact that this is the way it has to be. They are not obviously spiritual enough to be in these high places where the clergy are or where the convention speaker is or where some great person is. That You just resigned, I can't be there. And, and one of the other uh, points that is very relevant and very common is that they have a real inability to hear God real difficulty in hearing God. They can hear other people talking about hearing God, and sometimes, of course, that can be nonsense. People can talk very uh, flippantly about hearing God, and it's, you wonder whether it's really just their imagination. But then there are others who definitely hear God, and God speaks to them, and you know there's evidence to prove that God has spoken. Now, one of the common traits of these people was, first of all, they all went to church. They all go to evangelical churches. That's the first trait of most of them. The other thing was that despite going to church, they didn't particularly find that it was really relevant to where they were. The message would have been good. It was truth. I'm not here to say anything against churches. Listen, the problem that we have in our society, we're all involved. It's a problem. It's my problem as much as anybody else's. So I'm not here to point fingers, but I do on occasions point out truth to point out where we really are so that we can seek to address it. So they find that it's maybe not relevant to them in their lives and helping them. And the other uh, thing, feature that they found out was not only was their own uh, spiritual life quite dead, but they discovered in going to the church prayer meeting it was dead as well. So there's this common feature, and over many years now as a Christian, I have to say this has been almost a, a common thread from many Christians, from all walks of life and every denomination, this same note with one degree of uh, extreme to the other, but nevertheless, the same note. So what is the problem? I wouldn't question these people are converted, not for one moment. I have no doubt these people are Christians. So with this all in my mind, I was contemplating and thinking about what the Bible would have to say about that situation which is prevalent today. And my mind was turned to the book of Romans chapter 7, first of all. Now, there are two specific views held on the book of Romans chapter 7. The first view is that it's a non-converted Jew who is speaking, Paul as a non-converted man talking about wanting to keep the law of God as a Jew would, and yet unable to do it. And that's one view that's held by many. But there are also many that hold the other view, and I would lean to this other view. 
And the view that I lean to with others is that this is not an unconverted man, a Jew, but this is a converted person. This is a person who has come to faith in the Lord Jesus. And the grounds for which I say in this chapter why I believe it is a converted man is found in the verse 22 that we read. Because the statement of the writer is in verse 22, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Now that delight that's spoken of is a deep, internal joy. It's not a mental ascent of the mind, but it's a joy in the heart, a real delight and love and a real inner thrill at the Word of God. I believe that that can only really be the experience of a regenerate person. Because when we come to know Jesus as our Savior, then the Holy Spirit opens the Scripture. He gives us a hunger for the Bible. He interprets the Bible to us. That is the general experience of every true Christian. The Bible says, as newborn babes, when we're just converted, desire the sincere milk of the Word, the Bible, that ye may grow thereby. You must feed on the Bible. So what we have here, I believe, in chapter 7 is that of a believer, perhaps the experience of Paul himself. So a man who is regenerate, he's a Christian, but look what he's saying. Let me read it again to try and get the context and think of what we have said earlier about all these people. I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But, there's a problem. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity or imprisoning me to the law of sin. What he's stating very simply is, despite the fact that I have this inner longing and love for God and his word, I'm discovering that there's something else still operating in me. It's the law of sin. And he's saying that this problem is that I want to do what's good, but I don't do it. Things that I really don't want to do, I end up doing them. And then I feel condemned uh, and regret it afterwards. Then he comes to the uh, cry, as it were, the inner cry of a defeated man, as I believe it to be a Christian. Verse 24, O wretched man that I am. He's not accusing others. He's not talking about the pastor or what's going on with the finances in the church. He's not addressing here the dead prayer meeting. He's getting to the heart and the hub of the matter. He said, wretched man that I am. I am. He's not declaring how wonderful he is as a Christian, but quite the contrary, he's saying, it's not working at all. Oh, wretched man that I am. Then he says, not what shall deliver me, but who shall deliver me? He has tried the what. The what is all to do with activity. This is one of the modes that often people fall into to deal with this problem. What they do is they attempt by getting a lot of good doctrine into their mind and getting into what is the good church at the time and listening to good preaching. All those things are good, by the way. That's not bad. But the problem is that that in and of itself will not necessarily cure the problem. And that's why you find people who are in environments where God may even be working, and still they will declare outside, I'm, 
I'm failure. I'm, I'm not making it. I, it just seems so strange. I can't understand God. I can't grasp. I don't know God's will for my life. And all these issues are so prevalent in their mind. And they say, who, sh who shall, Paul says, who shall deliver me? You see, the solution is not in what we do. It is in who we place our trust. Who shall deliver me? Then the answer comes. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Chapter 7 is a very sad chapter in the book of Romans. It has been described as the funeral dirge of Romans. Failure. Defeat. But then we jump to chapter 8. And we move from a funeral dirge to a wedding march. We discover there's a complete transformation when we come to chapter 8, and there's one word in particular that keeps emerging consistently through chapter 8, and it is the Spirit. The Spirit. The Spirit. He has discovered the solution. The Holy Spirit. He has found out what was wrong, first of all, and he has got it resolved. And so, for a little time, I want to speak to you on spiritual ability. I want to try simply and biblically to explain how if I find myself in this position of deep failure, is there any solution for me today? Is there anything that can happen that could change my life? Despite the fact for years I may have been a Christian and I have resigned to this position. Well, I want to say that through the word of God, there is wonderful provision. Of course, things can change radically for you. They can change as far as God can change them. And that's how far. Can God change things? Of course he can. Well, the solution is found in God, the Holy Spirit. And so I want to take chapter 8, and I'm going to draw out some of the a glorious truths regarding the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to draw them out and we're going to go through them together. And I trust at the end that you will be able to see just what God has done for you and what God wants you to do in order for things to change. Because we have the solution. There's no plan B. There's no plan B. This is the solution. Now, some churches, of course, uh, thankfully, over the years, after the Reformation with the great uh, discovery of justification by faith alone, then since that, over a period of uh, centuries, there's been a gradual return of various truths that were lost uh, from the Dark Ages. The first rediscovery was justification by faith. But then after that, there were many other discoveries. Priesthood of all believers, for example. Uh, the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, I know that's controversial today, but nevertheless, there was the Pentecostal movement that was founded and formed, and what a, what a swathe of blessing came to the earth through the Pentecostal and Elam movement. What we have to remember is that we, we, should, not, um, we should not get lost in denominational labels because God has never placed his Holy Spirit essentially on a movement. God never places his Holy Spirit on machinery. God places his Holy Spirit on man. And the founders of these movements, or those who rediscovered the truth, they were the people upon which the Holy Spirit was poured. And as a result, the truth, with the anointing and power of the Holy Spirit, was then ushered back into society and into countries, so on and so forth. So let's look at what the Bible has to say about the truth of this spiritual ability that comes. First of all, in, in chapter, there's a few of the first ones are very, very simple, so we'll not labor at them. In verse 9, whenever the writer uh, Paul is writing here, he talks first of all about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Now, here it says in verse 9, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. He's talking to the Christians here who are at Rome, and he said to them, you're not in the flesh, that is, you're not unregenerate, unsaved people 
who are just attempting to keep the law, but he said, you are in the Spirit. You have been regenerated. That's what he's saying. You have become Christians. You have received the Lord Jesus at the new birth when you were converted. And he said, the Holy Spirit dwells in you. And then he said, now, if any man have not the Spirit of God, he is none of his. In other words, if the Holy Spirit does not dwell inside you, you do not belong to the Lord. We must understand and comprehend that. Uh, I was speaking during the week to a man, and he was saying, you know, I I don't know whether I give a tract, or I, I think he said I asked a minister who had his ministerial collar on, and he said to him, are you a Christian? And the minister got very, very annoyed. And very agitated, and it really was very condescending to him. How dare you? How dare you ask me, am I a Christian? Well, the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3 that we're to be ready always to answer any man that asketh us a reason of the hope that is in us with meekness and fear. If anybody came to me, if I had a ministerial collar or not, and said, if I, are you a Christian? I would be very glad to be able to tell him how I came to know Jesus Christ and would be very desirous and glad to tell it. You see, friends, what I'm saying is not every man that wears a collar has the Holy Spirit. Not every man that has been through Bible training has the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to tell you something else that might shock you. Not everybody that is a member of an evangelical church has the Holy Spirit. You say, that could not be. Well, read your Bible. You always find in the Bible that there were people who were not Christians, who were in amongst the Christians. Judas Iscariot is a perfect example. Anybody would have said Judas Iscariot is a follower of the Lord. He was with him. He watched his miracles. He was, the, he was the treasure of the group. Everything pointed to Judas Iscariot being a Christian. But the Bible says when he died and took his own life, he went to his own place. He wasn't a believer. And so this is wonderful to recognize, and it should be a great joy and thrill to the believer to recognize that I am indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. God lives inside me. That should thrill you when you wake in the morning, before you get out of your bed, to say, God lives inside me. You are a habitation of God through the Spirit. That should give us great hope. Because if God's in me, things can happen. So we not only have the indwelling. Now, isn't that a wonderful thing that God does that? He doesn't come and, and, and set himself beside us or stand around us, which he does that. He could have stopped there, but he didn't do that. He came right inside us. And where he comes is inside our spirit. The, the human individual, every man, has got three parts. We're made in God's image. We have a body, a soul, and a spirit. We're made in God's image. Now, when the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in us, he comes inside primarily our spirit, that's the part that the spirit detects the voice of God, the sense of God, the, 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 the presence of God, our spirit man. And when we are regenerated, when we're converted, the Holy Spirit comes inside our spirit and he fills our spirit. And so not only are we indwelt, but then this wonderful thing happens also mentioned here, and that is we receive the witness. The witness comes with his presence. And in verse 16, it says the Spirit, if you're authorized, it shouldn't be itself. It's a person. The Holy Spirit should be himself. The Spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Here's the Holy Spirit when he comes inside me and he begins to talk. He talks. And what he does initially is he talks to my soul. I'm regenerated by the Holy Spirit as he comes into my spirit and diffuses his presence through my entire personality, but he communicates with my mind. And what he says to my mind is he says, you belong to Jesus. And so you know, you know, you can tell people, I know I'm saved. I know I'm going to heaven. They say, how do you know? I say, I'm not sure how I know. I don't really know how I do know, but I do know. The reason why you know is because it's not something that happened just in your mind. 
It happened in your spirit. And your spirit knows God. And so the indwelling comes and the Lord gives us peace and rest. I hope you can look back to your conversion whenever the Holy Spirit entered and this deep peace came. This deep witness, this deep awareness, I belong to the Lord. If anything happens to me, if I die, if there's a train crash, if there's a plane crash, I wouldn't like that, but I know where I'm going. I know where I'm going. I know I'll be in heaven. That's the witness. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Do you ever thank the Holy Spirit that he gives you that witness? Maybe you get familiar with it and you just take it for granted. Do you ever thank him? Thank you so much for giving me that witness. Thank you for making me know each day that I know where I'm going. Thank you so much. That's so kind of you, Lord, to do that. Because it gives me peace. In a very tumultuous world, in a wicked world where there's war and fighting, calamity, and problems and all. And Lord, I have this peace. Thank you so much. The witness. For those of you who want to mark it, it's a good verse to mark, to keep regarding the witness of the Spirit in 1 John 4 and 13 as well. Because there it says, Here, Hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he dwells in us, because he has given us of his Spirit. So we have the witness of the Spirit. Well, then, let's move on. Those ones are fairly uh, familiar to the average Christian. Then we go back to verse 1 and 2, where Paul is speaking about this defeated man in the last verses of chapter 7. And he talks now about the supremacy of the Holy Spirit. Not the indwelling, not the witness, but the supremacy of the Holy Spirit. He is absolutely supreme. He's the winner. He's the one that prevails, the Holy Spirit. In verse uh, 1 and 2, it says, There's no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Who walk after the Spirit. And then it says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Alan, what in under goodness is that talking about? What it means very basically is this. Whenever a person places their confidence and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, having repented of their sin, the life-giving spirit who comes inside them begins to operate his laws through the individual. He begins to demonstrate his power in the person's life. We have mentioned a few of them already. That's his power in dwelling, giving the witness. But here he's talking of something deeper, the very heart of the problem that Paul is addressing here. He talks about in verse 2, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin of death. Here's a paraphrase of it to help you. The power of the life giving spirit, has freed you from the sin that leads to death. The life of the Holy Spirit indwelling you has freed you from the sin that leads to death. You see, friends, in this verse, the thought is that the Holy Spirit, when he comes into the believer, he is very intimate. <clears throat> He's a person. The Holy Spirit's a person, but he's very intimate. <clears throat> he likes to get really in close, and he likes us to share our life with him. He's a gentle man. He's very peaceable. His qualities are beautiful. He's described in the Bible as a dove, so he comes gently, but he, he, he's powerful, and he brings life. And the power of life that he imparts is greater than the power of sin and death, which may still be operating in the life of the Christian. Because as I've said, Paul's saying, O wretched man that I am, he said, who's going to deliver me? What's the solution to this sin issue in my life that I can't deal with? How do I get this power to live this life that, 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 that is spoken of? I mean, how is it going to happen? And Paul says, it's by the life-giving spirit. 
the Holy Spirit pours his life into my life. You see, friends, the problem with the law, uh, the Ten Commandments that was given to the Jews and to us indeed, (coughs) the problem with, with the law was that the Jews couldn't keep it. The problem was that they, they were sinners by nature. They had, they had received the sin nature from Adam, as we all have. And so when they received the law of God, rather than being able to keep it and therefore be righteous by keeping the law, instead the law condemned them. In other words, what happened was whenever they decided that they were living fairly moral lives and trying their best and they received the commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, all of a sudden they discovered there were adulterous thoughts in them. They discovered that there were desires in them that weren't good. When they read the commandment, thou shalt not covet, rather than them not doing it, they discovered that there was something operating in them that wanted to covet what belonged to others. And so what was happening was that the law, rather than releasing them, it actually condemned them. And so God used the law from then on in the New Testament. The law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. The law is the tool that God uses to bring people to a saving knowledge of Jesus. The law is presented to them to show them that they're guilty. The law is essential in bringing people to Christ. It is God's schoolmaster. So we present the law to people and they realize their conscience accuses them and tells them that they're guilty before God and that they need a savior. And that savior is Jesus Christ. Let me illustrate it. Sin and death are personified as a person, and the two of them come into the court. And they come to the court, and there I'm standing in the dock. And they come and say, well, this man's guilty. We, we are here to throw the book at him. He'll have to bear the consequences because he has acquiesced with us, and he's guilty. And so it doesn't look good for me. I am guilty. I have acquiesced. The law has condemned me to sin and death. The solution is that there's someone else who comes in, the Lord Jesus. He stands at the other side with the Holy Spirit and the Lord Jesus steps forward and he said, hold on. Yes, he is guilty. Yes, he is guilty of sin and death. He requires that for having broken the law of God. But I paid in full and I kept the law in full and I want to take that victory, that payment that I made to God for sin and death, I want to give that victory now to this man who's guilty. Are you willing to take it? I say, I'll take it. I'll take it. So I take it. Sin and death no longer have a claim on me, for he has paid it. And sin and death must leave. And the life-giving spirit from then on is constantly infusing his life and joy and peace. That's basically what it means. The supremacy of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the victor over sin. No matter what sin may be in your life, the Holy Spirit is more powerful. The Holy Spirit can defeat that, whatever it is, because it has already been paid for on the cross. Let's look at the practicality of it. We move from the supremacy to verse 4. The righteousness of the law, it might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. What does that mean, Alan? I was always afraid, by the way, of chapter 7 and 8. Just used to read them, pass by. I thought, can't read this. I don't know what he's talking about. I'm no clue. Just read by it. You ever do that? Let me paraphrase it. Verse 4. For our lives are regulated not by our earthly, but by our spiritual nature. Our lives are not regulated by our earthly, fallen nature, but by our spiritual nature. So, what we have here is the Holy Spirit sovereign in our life. Now, here's where the problems come for you and I. This is the core of this whole issue of defeat, going to church, getting nothing out of it, prayer meeting, dead, all that type of stuff. Here's here's where it comes from. Paul says to them, if the Spirit of God is going to really uh, have his way in your life, he said, you must walk after the Spirit. 
You must walk after the Spirit. This is not optional. In other words, he said, you must be led, guided, and directed by the Holy Spirit. That's it. It means, basically, to be completely preoccupied with the person and work of the Holy Spirit. In, in biblical terms or in church terms, it means lordship. <laughs> lordship. What does that mean? That means that I am grateful to God for his indwelling. I am grateful to God for the witness. He gives them freely. But when he entered into me and took possession within my spirit, man, he discovered that there were problems down deep inside that have not yet been addressed. And that is that I still have a sin nature. There's still something in me that wants to do what I shouldn't do. And so how do I deal with that? Well, the solution is the Holy Spirit must be given place in our lives. That is by a willful choice on our part. Now, some people have real problems in regard to the person of the Holy Spirit because they say, well, you know, I, I know somebody has been seeking to be filled with the Holy Spirit for 25 years. And I said, well, what, what are they expecting? And said, well, uh, you know, they've been reading about some great character, some book, some unusual man that has these giftings and callings and does for me. And they went, ah, I said that, but, you know, what does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? To be filled with the Holy Spirit doesn't mean that I become somebody else. It doesn't mean that I have certain gifts that God may have imparted to other people because God gives gifts according to his will. Not everybody's going to have the gift of another person. So you could be looking for the fullness of the Holy Spirit and never get it because God never intended you to have that gift. So what is the fullness? You must, you must comprehend what is the fullness of the Holy Spirit. It's not necessarily having a certain gift or emulating another person. Being filled with the Holy Spirit is God making you simply like Jesus. It is having the fruit of the Holy Spirit operating through your life. That is the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Gifts are separate. I'm sure you've heard the story of the man who had a beautiful house and a lovely sitting room, and he was very proud of it. But he received a wonderful inheritance from a relative. He loved the person so much that he brought in the inheritance. It was a picture. When he brought it in, he decided to put it on one of the walls where everyone would see it, but it seemed wherever he put it that the furniture and all, it just didn't look right. You're what, you ladies are familiar with this. And so he tried different walls and he pushed things about and pulled chairs about and tried around and his wife came in with him and they were getting nowhere and eventually in despair, he said, I, I've had it. I, I can't do this no more. This is not working. So they, what they did was they took the settee and the chairs and the little stools and, and book cabinets and other pictures and they took them all out and they put the picture where they wanted it to be. And then, little by little, they brought in the furniture and the pictures, and they set them all around the inheritance. You see, when you get converted, you receive an inheritance, the Holy Spirit. And everything else must be subject to him. He must be given that central place. That happens by an act of the will of the Christian, where I say, Lord, I will the Holy Spirit to have complete control of every area of my life. Now, what's interesting, what happens, and we'll move on, we're coming toward the close. Verse 7 and 8. There's many others, but these are the primary ones I'm looking at this evening. In verse 7 and 8, it says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, and it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be, so that they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Now look at verse 6. To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now, there's a common little word coming through those verses. You'll notice it, mind. Mind and minded. What does that mean? 
That means our mind is the functioning apparatus where we think, where we remember, where we have imagination. There's many gifts given in relation to the mind to a person. So the Bible says the unconverted person, their mind is fleshly. That is, their, there's, no, there's no operation of God whatever in the unconverted man. He's dead in trespasses and sins. He's cut off like the clergyman we mentioned. You have all the religious apparatus around you and all the rituals, dead to God, fleshly minded. But to be spiritually minded, here's where the spirit has entered into the spirit of the individual. To be spiritually minded is what? Is life and peace. What does that mean? That means as the Holy Spirit operates inside the life of the believer, he impacts the mind. Ah, this is lovely. The Holy Spirit puts his thoughts into my mind. The Holy Spirit begins to communicate through my thought patterns. That's how he works. He speaks. He speaks into my mind. And the more the Holy Spirit is given freedom in my life, the more he'll speak into my mind. And the more he speaks into my mind, I will become more, and I want to say reverently, you'll become more familiar with his voice. Some people say, I don't hear God, I don't know. But, well, you see, very often what happens is it's over a period. It doesn't happen very often like that. It's over a gradual period. You see, you get to know someone's voice. People that you first hear on the phone, you say, who are you? I never heard you before. <laughs> but if you've listened to them for years and years when they speak, you say, oh, right, I know you. I know who you are. So in like manner, as the Christian walks with God and they experience the fullness of the Holy Spirit operating in their lives, the voice of God becomes more familiar to them and they hear God and they know when God speaks to them. And God communicates into their heart. This is why God asks us, as believers, to have what we call the quiet time. This is the whole purpose of the quiet time. Now, many people do the quiet time and they have no idea really why they're doing it. Many do it because it's a kind of a, it's a kind of a, 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 a Protestant, a, kind of like a, a rosary bead thing. <laughs> We've got to do this. We just, what was that about? I have no idea. I've got to get out to work. I read a wee book, I read the Bible, was annoyed, I have no clue, slept halfway through it. What did you pray about? I can't remember, but it's, I've done, I've done. I've done it. Feel all right now. Why do you feel all right? Well, I don't feel, I don't feel bad in church whenever I go and preach about quiet times. But, you, but nothing happened in it. Oh, that doesn't matter. But you didn't meet God up, that doesn't matter. As long as I did it. And that's what we have done in a lot of, uh, not, being, not being rude, but and essentially there's not really a big difference between that and beads. He's just doing, doing a little ritual, a, a little religious ritual. So what is this quiet time then all about really? This quiet time, my friend, is to enable us to shut off the earthly, the fleshly, the things that fight against the spirit, it's to cut them off, to deny them, and to separate so that our mind, our body, our spirit, our being can let the Holy Spirit come so that we can attempt to, it's like priming a well. Did anybody here ever prime a well? Before you, whenever you went to a well that wasn't, wasn't running, you had to pour water in at the top. I'm letting go of my age here. You poured water in at the top, and then you started the pump. And once you did that, then it would draw the water, and the water would flow. But you had to prime it. And in a sense, the quiet time is like priming the pump. It's getting, seeking to get really close to God so that you can start the flow, and then the flow will continue into the rest of the day so that it enables you to walk in the fullness of the Spirit. You need time alone with God to prime. But what many Christians do is, they just do that thing and then they go and do their own thing. They don't comprehend even what quiet time is about. You see, it's that place where God gets a hold of the mind. 
And that's why the, the quiet time is always difficult because the enemy will come to distractions. He'll do everything in the area of the mind. It's to stop the Holy Spirit getting really to speak to us through the word and getting that absorbed so to prime us to go on after God. <clears throat> now you'll notice in verse 20, <clears throat> 26 and 7, likewise the Spirit helps our infirmities where we know not uh, what to pray as we ought. Now here's the problem. We go to pray. What am I going to pray? Well, again, a lot of a lot of dear, lovely Christians, they have their list, and we go down the list. It's just like going to ASDA. Whenever you know, whenever they come out and they leave the groceries and they leave the list and you ticket, yeah, that, that's it. That's it. They came today to my house. I had no idea what was in it. I said that'll be fine. That's all right. Just ticket. it. And for many dear Christians, that's that's prayer. You're just going down a list. I'm not against lists. If the Spirit of God is leading you on the list, that's okay. But my dear friends, what the purpose of prayer is for you to permit the Holy Spirit who indwells you to come and put his desire into your mind so that you can then, as you wait in quiet time or whether during the day, that you can pray that to God and you bring those issues that the Holy Spirit is laying on you and you lay them and you bring them to him and you pray them. And because they have started and were enabled and commenced in the heart of God by the Holy Spirit, as they're sent to God, then they come back. And this is where true praying, real praying, Spirit-anointed praying comes. And it's wonderful because you get into a, a divine cycle where God draws you into his purpose and plan in prayer. But that, that is virtually lost today. My, my, uh, what I hear frequently from people who come uh, is that, Alan, uh, the, my praying is either a list or my prayer meeting, if I didn't go, I wish they would just on January the 1st, they would, all the people would pray because if you go in December, they're still praying the same prayer. Now, I don't want to be cruel, but I want to say this. If that is what happens, that is not praying in the Holy Spirit. That is fleshly praying. That will never touch God. Never. And what it proves is that the individuals who are praying themselves have not comprehended the work of the Holy Spirit. They have not given the Holy Spirit his place in their lives. As a result, they are not hearing from God. So what they have done is they have become like the rosary bead. They are praying the same thing over and over and over again. And they do it for years. And if, no, nobody, if God doesn't answer, nobody asks any questions. Do anybody ever think, you know, you prayed about that for, prayed that for about 50 years? And then others who say, well, we're praying, but often Christians pray so vaguely, they pray such a vague prayer, oh, God bless us, that at the end of the day, sure, how would you know whether he blessed you or not? <laughs> Whereas in the Bible, you read that people prayed specific prayers. They got answers. Because they prayed in the Holy Ghost. That's what Jude said, praying in the Holy Ghost. Let's come toward the end. <clears throat> Prayer. Turn with me to verse 13. Here in verse 13 it says, For if ye live after the flesh ye shall die, but if through the Spirit ye do mortify, if ye you, you mortify the deeds of the, of the body ye shall live. Now, here's the key. This is the key verse. Look at it. If ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. If ye through the Spirit mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. What is the big word? If. It doesn't happen automatically. Fullness of the Spirit's not automatic. I know many fine preachers and, and servants of God, and I'm not here to... But many Christians say, oh, when you're saved, you're filled with the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I was talking to a friend recently about that, and he said, you know, um, he said, you know that's, that's what my pastor believes. I said, oh, well, that's fine. I mean, I, I, mean I, I wouldn't want to argue with your pastor, but I don't believe it. I disagree with him. And I said, uh, he says, well, he'd be, you know, he'd go down a certain line, Calvinistic line, and uh, so on. If you don't know what that is, don't worry. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's a certain view. <clears throat> and I said to him, well, it's very interesting because 
One of the greatest Calvinists in preachers in Britain was called Martin Lloyd-Jones. He was a great man of God. And Martin Lloyd-Jones was, was, was a really anointed man. He was, he was Calvinistic. He believed certain truths that were, that were fine. I, I was very, I'm very happy to follow Martin Lloyd-Jones. I think he's a wonderful man. And the point is, he took this particular view. But Martin Lloyd-Jones got into trouble. <laughs> and he wrote a book called Joy Unspeakable, and he got into real trouble. Because what Martin Lloyd-Jones, after many years, as a great preacher and the evangelical voice of Britain for decades, he got up in a meeting one day and he said, you know, friends, I don't believe when we are converted, we are filled with the Holy Spirit. He said, and I'll tell you, it's a very simple explanation. He says, if when we are converted, we are filled with the Holy Spirit, and our churches are filled with the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to quote what he said. He said, why in God's name are we in the state we're in? He got into trouble for it. But of course, it's true. It's true. Of course, there's something wrong. I mean, you don't have far to go to find these problems. Of course, there's something radically wrong. People are not filled with the Holy Spirit when they're converted. They're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit baptizes them into the body of Christ. Of that, there's no doubt. But to be filled with the Holy Spirit, my friend, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, then you're filled with the likeness of Jesus. I'm sure you heard about the little girl. She said one time to her mommy, she says, Mommy, where's, where's God going to put all the Christians that are not nice? The wee girl had plenty of sense, hadn't she? Where does God put the Christians that are not nice? She caught on. She didn't know about spirit-filled or anything, but she had caught it. You're not nice. You're not spirit-filled, my friend. Got a different, there's a different life coming through. It's the, that's the old flesh. That's the old flesh fallen nature coming through. You see, what here is said in verse 13, he says, if ye do mortify, that means to put to death. If you put to death the flesh, the soul. So this is the sin, this is the boy that creates all this conflict within. So you have to put him to death. Well, you say, how do you, how do, you do that, Alan? How do you? Well, Jesus said, except ye die. He says, except ye take up the cross. Yeah, you see, it's very costly. This is the reason why it's not, not for spirit true spirit fullness in lives is not that common today and the simple reason is that people are not willing for the price that's the reason the holy spirit's longing to fill the holy spirit's longing to bring you into the arena of the supernatural the holy spirit is longing to use you and to reveal jesus to you i mean there's no problem with that he's well able to do it and he longs to do it but the problem is are you willing to die dying's not easy Unless you mortify, put to death the flesh. You say, what does that mean practically, Alan, as we close? Well, you see, friends, what I want you to want to want to point out very simply is that it's a spiritual transaction between not being filled and being filled. There's a spiritual transaction takes place. Sometimes it is extremely radical in people's lives. It can be like a, it literally like getting converted again. And many can testify to that. It's like a new conversion where the power of the Holy Spirit gets such freedom in their lives. It seems as though their eyes are open in a way that were never open before. It just seems so different. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, a Baptist, a Baptist, said this. He said, there is an experience for the Christian when they're filled with the Holy Ghost that brings them as far above the standard Christian as the standard Christian is above the world. Spurgeon said that. He was Baptist, but he was full of the Holy Ghost. You see, my dear friend, what he's saying is the average Christian are just kind of going along, but he said there is an encounter, there's an experience with God that brings you as far above them as what they are above the ungodly. I believe he's absolutely right. I believe that's true. What's the key? Read all the great 
great servants of God, read the testimonies of the great missionaries, and you'll discover either there's a very radical transformation many testify to. One was said of George Mueller, he was brethren. There's not really a lot to do with, you know, these men, different theology, but the common denominator was they all met God. That's the common denominator. They met God and the Holy Ghost got his way in their lives. They said to George Mueller, Mr. Mueller, how is it you have become such an amazing man by faith that you can look after 2,000 children, buy uh, 6,000 pairs of shoes a year, you feed thousands of children, you never ask for money, money just comes in from all over the world and you never let anybody know and always the right amount comes at the right time and that has gone on for over half a century. Miss, what is the secret to it all? Do you know what George Mueller, an old man, said? There was a day in the life of George Mueller when he died. He died to himself. He died to his own opinion and the opinion of others, and ever since he has sought to follow the Lord. That's the secret. There was a day when I died. Have you a day when you died? <laughs> died to yourself. And said, Holy Spirit, you'll have your way. From now on, it's your life. From now on, you'll get control. I'm not looking for an experience. I'm not looking for some uh, rep to replicate what something happened. I, eh, not at all. I don't want to replicate. I mean, God, Holy Spirit dwells in me. God knows my need. I'll come to God. And I say to God in prayer, Lord, I give myself com completely over to you. I yield my body, my abilities, my skills, my money, everything I have. I choose to die. I choose to give everything to you. And that's painful, but Lord, it's worth it because if I give everything unconditionally for you, only for your glory and honor, then I simply trust you. Lord, come. Come by your Holy Spirit. Come, Lord, and fill me. Come and take possession of me. Come and renew my mind. Come and quicken me that I can see things, that I can begin to pray in the Holy Spirit, that I can begin to be led by the Spirit, that the Holy Spirit opens the Word of God to me, that I begin to become a soul winner because the desire of Jesus is living through me to win the lost. And so the Holy Spirit does all these things and many more as he's given freedom. Very simple. Well, let's close. I've said that three times, but this is it. <laughs> you, you, most of you know what I'm like, but I am closing. All right, verse 7. This is very important. Sorry, verse 10. We've looked at verse 7. Verse 10. <clears throat> and if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall quicken your mortal body by a spirit that dwelleth in you. It's those kind of verses that I read years ago and said, I just have to pass by here. I don't know what they're talking about. What is it talking about? Verse 10, it says the Christian dies. You'll die. If Jesus doesn't return, you'll die. See this old body you have? It's getting a bit creaky and things not working the way they should and teeth falling out and hair falling out and all that type of stuff. Listen, it says here that we're going to die. The body will die. And that's the result of sin. But, if, part A of verse 10, as, uh, if Christ be in you, the body is dead. The body will die because of sin. Physical frame will die. Then he says, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. What does that mean? What it means is that although your physical body dies, that's the end of death. That's it over. That's death, that's death and sin finito. No coming back. Because the Spirit who indwells you, He will not permit your soul or your spirit to die. He will escort you to heaven. He will bring you to heaven. Now, you'll have to leave your body in the grave, and it's good to care and look after it and so on and tidy up around. <clears throat> but nevertheless, the body will die. It will die. But not the spirit. Not, not the soul. No, they won't die. They go to glory. Like Billy Graham the other day. And others who have served the Lord and you don't walk with him. Go to heaven. Go to heaven. That's wonderful. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. That's the reason why when you die, your spirit and soul don't, don't go down. They go up because of the Holy Spirit. He'll be there. Is that the end? 
One more point. <laughs> what happens then? You say, well, you were saying, Alan, kind of look after you know, the body in the grave. And, you know, yeah, I think you should look after the body in the grave. I think it should be kept. It, it is a place of respect. Why? Because God's not finished with it. That's why. The body's not finished with. See, it says in verse 11, because this is going, jumping from verse 8 to verse, or verse 10 to 11, this is jumping right through time. It says, but if the spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead will also quicken your mortal body by a spirit that dwelleth in you. Not only is there a quickening that can come on us spiritually in our lives, but there is going to come a day whenever we're quickened literally from the grave. And God's going to take the old body that was corrupt and fallen. Now, I don't know what I'll look like when I get my new body. I don't think I'll have glasses. I think I'll be a bit better looking. I would have thought and tidied up. But God's going to take what, something of what was in the grave. God's going to take that back. And that's going to be given an incorruptible eternal body. And that will be by the power of the Holy Spirit. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead will raise us from the dead. Why would you not want the Holy Spirit to control? I mean, when he does all that, and much more. Why would you not want him to be in absolute control of every area of your life? Why would you not want to mortify the flesh so that he can get his place? Spiritual ability. The only solution, my friend, to deadness, dryness, apathy, powerlessness, all those things, is the power of the Holy Spirit resting on your life and mine. Let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your precious word. We thank you that your word is truth. We want to thank you, Lord, for all that we're conscious of in our lives, of the working of the Holy Spirit. And yet our longing would be, Lord, that we would know more, that we would enter into greater. O oh, gracious Lord, Please send the Holy Spirit to come and minister into lives here tonight. 